Federal police have moved a step closer towards winding up their investigation and possibly charging an ABC journalist for publishing classified information. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And it's now three years since the ABC published the Afghan files alleging war crimes by Australian soldiers in Afghanistan. And it's more than a year since federal police raided ABC headquarters looking for leaked secret documents on which that series was based. Last week, the AFP finally recommended the Commonwealth DPP consider charging one of the journalists, Dan Oakes, while the other, Sam Clark, will not be prosecuted. Journalists around the country tweeted their outrage, and ABC News boss Gavin Morris leapt to the defence of his men. The journalism that Dan did and Sam did here was good journalism. Uh, none of the, the facts of the, of the story have been disputed, uh, and uh, all these guys were doing was doing their jobs professionally as journalists. Last week, the head of the SAS admitted that Australian war crimes in Afghanistan did take place. And no less than 55 alleged breaches of the rules of war are being examined by the Brereton Inquiry, expected to report this month, after which prosecutions are almost certain to follow. On Twitter, Dan Oakes swung the spotlight off his own predicament and back onto the soldiers. Whether or not we are ever charged or convicted over our stories, the most important thing is that those who broke our laws and the laws of armed conflict are held to account. Our nation should be better. So, what is next? The good news is the Attorney-General, who holds veto power, may stop charges against Oakes going ahead. As he said in October... I would be seriously disinclined to consent to the prosecution of a journalist where they'd done no more than pursue uh, public interest journalism. But even if he blocks the prosecution, how satisfactory is that? Not very. As a Griffith law professor, AJ Brown, told me to watch... The Attorney-General should not have this discretion at all. Politically, it's a hospital pass. But more importantly, globally, it's a proven mistake to give politicians control over which charges do and don't go ahead. This is exactly how the criminal law gets used as a political weapon. In Oakes' case, it may be the only thing that saves him from jail. But what's really needed is for the law to be changed, to protect the public's right to know and the journalist's right to tell them. As Professor Brown says... We need a comprehensive overhaul of the law, both on the media freedom side or journalism shield law side, and on the whistleblower protection side. And in particular, in my view, the laws need to be changed to redefine what is secret, so that matters that genuinely threaten national security cannot be reported, but things that merely embarrass the government can. Or, as journalist Peter Grester from the Alliance for Journalist Freedom told the ABC last year... We think that burden of proof needs to be shifted to the authorities to show why prosecution should go ahead in the first place. And that, we think, would restore some of the balance and, and it would also um, under, underscore the importance of whistleblowers and, and journalists to maintaining transparency and accountability in government. Until then, a fine investigative journalist lives with the threat of jail for doing his job. And other reporters on the front line are chilled by knowing it might also happen to them. But now, to Hong Kong, where life is a great deal more difficult for journalists and just got harder with Beijing's draconian new national security law. Multiple arrests here. It's been a game of cat and mouse with police and, and protesters all night. But if the aim of this new law, which bans sedition, subversion, uh, collusion with foreign forces and terrorism, is to create fear, then it certainly is working. The new laws, aimed at shutting down the pro-democracy movement, are backed by lengthy jail terms and, in some cases, trials in mainland China. And last week, as protesters voiced their anger on the streets, reporters were in the thick of it, targeted by water cannons, literally knocked off their feet and hit by pepper spray. Jimmy Lai, founder of Hong Kong's pro-democracy tabloid, Apple Daily, told Associated Press that democracy in Hong Kong is finished. It's worse than the worst scenario imagined. Hong Kong is totally subdued, totally under control. It's sad that Hong Kong is dead. And that may go for a free press as well, as his own paper told readers. For many years, Hong Kong media have been largely free to criticise China as they saw fit. But Beijing has been tightening the screw. In 2002, Hong Kong was 18th on the World Press Freedom Index. Today, it is 80th. And it will sink further as China imposes laws that demand the Hong Kong government... ..strengthen public communication, guidance, supervision and regulation over matters concerning national security, including those relating to schools, 
universities, social organisations, the media and the internet. Until now, Hong Kong has enshrined press freedom under Article 27 of its basic law. But it's feared these new laws will be used to harass, intimidate, silence and prosecute journalists. As Reporters Without Borders noted in the Wall Street Journal... Standard journalism work, like interviewing a pro-democracy activist in Hong Kong or taking a picture of a protester vandalising public property, could be construed by authorities as promoting insurrection. And already you can see what it will mean. As Hong Kong legislator and former journalist Claudia Mo told the BBC... They're now arresting people for owning a banner on that sort of issue, and it's a crime. Can you believe it? I mean, people can't even talk about it, let alone uh, advocate it. And there will be not just speech crimes, but thought crimes in Hong Kong. And reinforcing the point, Hong Kong police tweeted an image of the first person arrested under the new laws. His crime? Holding a Hong Kong independence flag. And when that was retweeted by China's global television network based in Beijing, the flag was censored. But that's no surprise, says ABC's China correspondent Bill Bertels. Mainland Chinese are being told very little of the Hong Kong protests. Very heavy censorship up here, Roz. Uh, Any time an international news channel has stories about Hong Kong, the screens go to black and the government up here in China is just feeding people constant stories, day in, day out, telling them that Hong Kong is overwhelmingly a welcoming this law, that they're celebrating this law. It's no wonder Hong Kong's Foreign Correspondents Club is worried. In a letter to the Hong Kong government, it is seeking guarantees on press freedom. No topic will be off limits or taboo for journalists, including sensitive political issues. Reporters must not be barred from press conferences. Citizens must be free to speak to journalists without fearing for their safety or risking legal action. So far, the Correspondents Club has received no joy and it's most unlikely to get any. For Hong Kong and its media, these are dark days. But now, let's come back to Australia and the rarest of sights, a newspaper editor saying sorry and doing it on the front page of the paper. In Monday's newspaper, the West Australian published a Modesty Blaze cartoon that contained offensive racial stereotypes and slurs we consider abhorrent. We are deeply sorry and we apologise for any hurt that cartoon has caused. Apologising for a comic strip, how bad could it have been? It's a word so offensive, we won't broadcast it, but the West Australian published it. Just really disappointed that a major media outlet and pr pretty much the only newspaper in WA has stooped so low to use that language. And it wasn't just the three-letter slur beginning with A in the archaic British comic strip Modesty Blaze that had readers spitting out their cornflakes. The cartoon contains the word Aborigine, which is considered politically incorrect and offensive, and an even more derogatory term is used to reference an Indigenous person in the text, saying, quote, he will smell us out quicker than a bloodhound. So, how did it happen? Well, as Seven West Media's TV arm had to confess that night... The Modesty Blaze strip was put in the pages from an outside agency, but it wasn't checked before print. It is a bad mistake, and importantly, it undermines what has been a unique commitment to Indigenous issues and racial equality by the West Australian. As editor Anthony de Segley told Seven News last week, he was, quote, aghast because... We feel our current team has worked hard to report on racial injustice in a mature and sensible manner. And it should get credit for that. For Reconciliation Week in May, the West Australian remade its masthead and set about educating its readers with... Home Truths on Reconciliation. Why every West Australian has an obligation to learn the tough truths of state's history. It ended the week with another two-page spread telling readers to confront racism and enough is enough. Then last month, as Black Lives Matter protests multiplied, the paper gave voice to two black women on its front page. Racism in our nation is rife. Why I must march against racism. And instead of condemning the protesters for stopping traffic or spreading the virus, it gave them the front page to explain their actions. Compare that to coverage in the News Corp tabloids on the East Coast, which ran front pages like this. One mass insult. covid -iots. The West has also used its back page to campaign against racism in sport and the front page to highlight the scourge of Indigenous incarceration. And that's why, even after last week's comic catastrophe, 
Studio 10 presenter Narelda Jacobs, a West Australian and one of the few Indigenous faces on Australian TV, offered a bouquet. The West Australian has, uh, needs to be applauded for a, a, a commendable job it's been doing during the Black Lives Matter protests. They ran um, a campaign supporting the, the protests and, uh, you know, when a lot of uh, major mastheads were kind of doing the opposite, really. So, good on them. And we hope their commitment to Indigenous issues and fessing up to their mistakes continues. And finally, to the ABC and political correctness gone mad. Or a colossal beat-up that's fit for a king. Here is the Daily Telegraph's front page splash from 11 days ago. Checkmate. Professional chess players and coaches have taken on the foolish ABC for wasting taxpayer dollars organising a radio segment discussing whether the board game is racist. So why on earth did that story make front page news? And what was all the fuss about? Well, it had kicked off two days earlier when a radio producer on Afternoons with James Valentine rang chess player John Adams about a discussion they were planning for the program about why white goes first in chess and whether it's another example of black coming off worse. An angry Adams refused to take part and then fired off this provocative tweet. The ABC have taken the view that chess is racist given that white always go first. Trust the taxpayer-funded national broadcaster to apply ideological Marxist frameworks to anything and everything in Australia. As you can see, political correctness gone mad. And soon Australia's conservative culture warriors were queuing up to voice their outrage. Yes, this is just total and absolute madness. With Liberal Senator Jim Molan telling Sky's Chris Smith... There is a bigger agenda here. We can laugh at idiots who, who talk about why white goes first or getting rid of uh, redskins. But this is a concerted effort to get rid of revenue out of uh, conservative media and anything that looks like a conservative uh, and destroy the conservative voice in this country. Yes, seriously, it's a left-wing plot. And next morning, John Adams was sounding off again to 2GB's Ben Fordham. All of this stuff is completely ridiculous. I mean, we've got big issues to, you know, that's facing Australia and I don't want the ABC to be talking about this sort of nonsense. By then, the ABC's stupidity was also causing jaws to drop on Nine's Today Extra, where the self-titled Sassy, switched on Carla Bignasca, was equally scathing. I can't believe that we're actually spending taxpayers' money on having this debate on our public broadcaster. That is all mm. I have to say about it. I think it's ridiculous. Now, it's important to note that at this point, James Valentine's show with the segment in question had not even gone to air. And when he finally got behind the mic that day, he was bemused by the fuss. There's been a lot of talk about the fact that the ABC, and specifically this program, Afternoons with me, James Valentine, we were going to do a program where we declared that chess is racist. That's not actually what happened, and it's not actually what we ever intended to do. No. No, we weren't going to do that. Valentine then explained how the idea had come about, starting with this tweet from a father teaching chess to his son, who had mused about changing the rule that white must go first, and had asked... Please help me understand whether this is a long overdue correction of past injustice or just political correctness gone mad. That had kicked off a heated debate on social media which Valentine wanted to follow up, as he eventually did on the program, by interviewing Tasmanian state champion Kevin Bonham about White's number one status and concluding that race had nothing to do with it. Now, this may seem like a trivial or even ridiculous exercise, but as Valentine explained... If you're a regular listener to this program, you would know that these are the sort of things we often do. The curiosities of human behaviour, some of the stuff that illuminates the little byways and the, the stuff that doesn't get a lot of stuff. So, was that the end of the story? No, not at all. Cue a new wave of outrage from all the usual suspects. I mean, the whole thing is just so insane. It's crazy because you're paying for it. We're all just pawns in a bigger game being played by the left. And next day came that telly front page with a new accusation that the ABC was hating on popular confectionery after Valentine made a couple of teasing comments about other areas of white privilege. See, I think the key of C is racist, quite frankly. Uh, we'll be looking at that a little bit later. You know, if you're not musical and don't know the piano, when you're playing key of C, it's all the white keys. And I'm also going to advocate later that minties come in white and black. It's just wrong. Naturally, the telly failed to see the joke, perhaps deliberately, and went on the attack again. 
Valentine's chess discussion ran for about seven minutes. The coverage on Sky, 2GB and Today Extra lasted three days and filled 30 minutes of airtime. While the telly filled several pages of news, plus comment from Tim Blair, James Morrow and Ray Hadley. And the story was so big, it even made it onto America's Fox News. And inspired Russia's former world chess champion Garry Kasparov to join the pylon. And in general, people said, I can't believe that the ABC, why there's so much going on, your, your pandemic, your job loss, your you know, general decline in the economy, are, uh, are talking about this sort of thing. I can't believe that when a pandemic and a job loss, you're spending time talking about what we're doing. I mean, it's just ridiculous, isn't it? Yes, it is. But welcome to the culture wars. That's all from us tonight. There's more on our website, including a statement from John Adams, which I'd encourage you to read. And don't forget, Media Bytes, every Thursday on your favourite social media platform. But for now, until next week, goodbye. <laughs>